Eye on Horror, the official podcast of iHorror.com. This is episode 118, otherwise known as season six, episode 19. I am your host, James J. Edwards, and with me, as always, is your other host, Jacob Davison. How are you doing, Jacob? Doing good. It's chilly this morning, so I'm wearing my hoodie. <laughs> it's Yeah, we're not, we're wimps. We're not used to this. By chilly, it's probably 45 <laughs> well, I mean, I'm not, I mean, I'm an East Coaster, man. I'm used to, you know, the cold temperatures. It's just, you know, buildings on this coast are not built for cold weather. So it gets a lot cooler inside these places a lot easier. It's uh, I, I, I'm a California dude. So, yeah, no, this is cold for me. Uh, also with us, as always, is your other other host, John Korea. How you doing, Korea? It's that beautiful time of year where I'm reminded of that letter Kenny clip where they make fun of people from L.A. And they're like, oh, <laughs> hiking tacos, hiking tacos. Why don't you go get a taco while you're on a hike? Fuck off. Um, <laughs> but they have because I remember watching it and being like, ha L.A. people. I've done that. I've done that. But then the second they go like, oh, you know, it gets cold in the desert. It's just a different kind of cold, you know, and I'm just like, fuck, I feel attacked. Because it's because Jacob is right. It, first of all, it is a different kind of cold. Fuck off. Second of all, these buildings are not made for for the cold. So yeah, it does get cold here. It is forty five degrees. Uh, I'm still wearing shorts because New England <laughs> born and raised. But you know, it's fine. Uh, I live in shorts, shorts and flip flops. So like even. Uh, it could be raining and I'll cruise out in short. I, I had a guy make fun of me, one of my critics group members who um, he's like, I don't think I've ever seen you wear pants, but I also don't think I've ever seen your arms because I'm always wearing like a hoodie or a jacket or something, <laughs> <laughs> but I'm always in shorts. Uh, Beautiful. Uh, before we get into it, I want to give a special shout out and congratulations to Emma and Brandon Emma on and Brandon, getting, yep. getting married this weekend. Congratulations, guys. That was a that was an amazing wedding. A very yeah, no, it was a beautiful ceremony, and yeah, we both had an amazing time. Yeah, uh, what table did you sit? They had each table was themed after a holiday horror movie. I got elves. What did you get, Jacob? December. <laughs> nice. And uh, Jonathan, have you seen elves? No, but I found oh, man. Uh, I found a few links to be able to watch it because uh, after sitting at the table, I'm like, I feel like I have to. That has to be on the holiday list now. So, uh, oh, man, I discovered it in high school and it stars Grizzly Adams and has this immortal <laughs> line. I, I want to know the connection between the elves and the Nazis. Speaking of Nazis, um, my uh, <laughs> I know we, you did. I'm the king of transitions. Um I've been mainly catching up with awards stuff and seeing basically it, it's the awards push. So for by critics groups, I've just been having to watch a whole bunch of that kind of stuff. And um, one of the things I saw that was really interesting is the zone of interest. Have either of you guys seen or heard about the zone of interest? No, uh, I've heard about it. It's the new movie from Jonathan Glazer, who did um, Under the Skin, that movie with Scarlett Johansson as an alien a few years back. Okay. The zone of interest is about um, it's about this Nazi commandant at at Auschwitz who built this idyllic little this idyllic little uh, compound right outside the gates of Auschwitz for his family to grow up, you know, to to live in and his kids to grow up in and everything. And, you know, there's like a little pool there. There's a yard they play in and, and it's like right near this river and. It, it it's just this weird little juxtaposition of this this little pleasant life he's built for his family and then th the sound is amazing in it because there's the constant sound of like gunshots and screaming and and stuff like that and at one point um you hear like guards going get him get him get him and you hear a guy screaming and then they go drown him in the river drown him in the river you know and you're it's it's all in german so you have to read the subtitles so you know even if you you know can't make out the noise um it, it tells you but it's just it, it's just a fascinating little experiment in i mean it, it's really it's one of those movies that there's not a whole lot of plot to it's all atmosphere um but man it's 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 kind of kind of dirty it, it just there's one scene where the commandant is talking to um he's having a meeting and it, what you figure out is that these guys are selling him a new crematorium for the camp and you're like oh my god this is just uh, yeah it's a tough one 
Sounds like a real fun movie to watch it, with the it's, family. It's, it's not a feel good. <laughs> it's not a feel good at all. Yeah. But it is. Uh, it's 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 a pretty important one, and it's really well made. It's very well made. But yeah, it's a uh, it's a tough one. The zone of interest. It's called, and whew. that's rough. Well. Opposite end of the spectrum, uh, I finally watched the Marvels, uh, which was really difficult because uh, they were already pulling it from theaters when I saw it like three weeks ago. I saw it like right after we recorded our last episode. And uh, yeah, I don't understand the complaints. It's a fun movie. It, it, it is. It, it, it honestly, like out of the slew of like Marvel projects to come out recently, this feels like the most like self-contained story. This feels like. Like, yes, I understand it is a little aggravating that you had to watch WandaVision and Miss Marvel and the previous Captain Marvel and like five other things to like fully know what was going on. But I I mean, even if you didn't watch those, they did a nice little like, oh, this is where they're at now, you know, like a very quick, like it, um, organic thing. It was just a fun movie and it that all the characters progressed. It I like I, I there was I, there were some complaints I saw of like the black girl magic line. And it's like, she doesn't, people are like, oh, so what, she gets her powers from from that? And it's like, no, that was just Nick Fury encouraging someone. Like, do you not know the, the term Black Girl Magic? Come on. It's, it just felt like a lot of the criticism came from like, do you not want women to be happy? Like, or have fun? <laughs> I think a lot of these people don't. Yeah. It was, it was, yeah, it was fun. Like, come on. It's like, well, superhero movies especially are allowed to be fun. Like not everything has to be based off of a Frank Miller run of something. Okay. That's it. That's my pedestal. No, I, I thought the Marvels was, I mean, I, I they, they did have fun with it. Like you said, like, like it, it, for anyone who hasn't seen it by now, um, it basically Captain Marvel and two other heroes, their powers get mixed up. So they, um, they're always, uh, teleporting between each other, switching and, spots. Yeah. Yeah. And I loved it when they were, trying to get a handle on what's happening so they're like jump playing jump rope and then they're switching in the middle yeah. <laughs> it's, it's it's fun i i thought that montage of them like working that out together and learning yeah. how to work as a unit and switch because it's only when they use their powers at the same time so yeah. like they can coordinate like attacks and stuff together and doing that. That like, yeah, dude, like it was silly. It was fun. And the thing is I didn't watch any, I watched WandaVision, but I didn't watch any of the other shows. Mm. Um, and I understood what was going on. I mean, they do do a nice little wrap up at the beginning, you know, with, with you know, with the uh, Ms. Marvel talking about, and then we're going to be besties and she's going to say cool name. You know? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Oh, yeah. And, and and that was the thing I appreciated most was because I, I think in the previous episode, I even brought up in Miss Marvel. The only thing that was like really groany was her like was was her like fanboying constantly over like the superheroes. And then like in, you know, the Marvels, they address it. And she's like, oh, sorry for putting you on a pedestal and like not treating you like a person to like Captain Marvel. And like I was like, yeah, thank you. That was that's great character. Yeah, development. Although, I mean, that is part of that is thing, too, is that is part of her character that she's a superhero fangirl. So yeah. it just comes with the territory. But no, I'm with you. Like, it, it was fun. Like, I don't get what uh, the big, you know, uh, deal was with uh, people getting mad about it. Well, according to Bob Iger, the problem was they didn't have enough executives on set. That's the issue. <laughs> yep, yeah, throw needed to cost under the bus. Classy well, move. Maybe uh, that's why I liked it more. <laughs> uh, yeah, no, needed to cost in my book so far can do no wrong. Like, like I will support her work forever. Have a? Uh, I don't think we've talked about it yet. Have you guys both watched The Killer? Yes. No. You haven't seen it. Oh, I dude, know. You, I know. You, you got to go watch the killer. Like you're missing as soon, as, as soon as we hit stop, dude, this is it's the new uh, it's the new David Fincher movie. It's on Netflix. It stars Michael Fassbender. It's like a hitman. And you know what is it's like it's kind of like American Psycho. If the if the hero was a hitman, <laughs> I mean, there's there's this little narration the whole time, you know, and it's not bothersome though. When it first started and he's narrating the whole thing, I'm like, ah, this is going to get old, but it didn't get old. And, um, and the thing is the guy, one of the most impressive things about it is like, he'll, when he's basically when he's doing anything, but mostly when he's going to perform his hits, he'll start listening to the Smiths. So he'll put in his earbuds and he'll dial up his iPod and it's like, oh, there is a light and it never goes out. And, 
<laughs> it's <laughs> what difference does it make? It, um, it's it's just. Uh, Dude, you got to watch it. I don't even want to talk. It's it's basically he has a hit that goes wrong. Mm. And so his world kind of implodes and he's kind of he kind of goes John Wick, but he also kind of goes on the run a little bit. Yeah, it's a uh, bit more grounded than a John Wick type. It of definitely is more grounded, although he does. There's one fight scene where there's no way he would have just gotten up and walked away from it like he did. <laughs> that was a little John Wick. But yeah. um. I think Guillermo del Toro uh, tweeted saying that it felt like David Fincher made a Charles Bronson movie and that yeah. got me super hyped. But hearing that he listens to the Smiths kind of like diminishes that a little bit because fuck more. Yeah, although uh, there was a great letterbox <laughs> review that said uh, this is about the least sociopathic Smiths fan. <laughs> yeah. All right, I'm back. I'm back. I'm back. Yeah, that's all I need. It's just some snarky comment like that of people recognizing. Yeah. It, it, it's just kind of a cool ju- juxtaposition because he's doing these violent things and Smith's is not violent music. It's uh, <laughs> it's very melancholic. The lyrics are kind of morbid, but they're like shoplifters of the world. <laughs> yeah. And also like the, he has a re- reason in, u- in universe for that, because like it uh, when he's about to shoot, like he's doing a sniper mission, like it helps with his tempo. Yeah. He, he wears like a, um, like a Fitbit kind of a thing. And he um, it's like, he won't pull the trigger until his heart rate is to a certain, uh, certain rate, you know, until he gets his heart rate down and I, and the Smiths helps him, you know, mellow out. It's a, uh, it's really, dude, you, you, you got to watch it tonight, dude. Just had the thought like, Oh yeah. The least psychopath or sociopathic, like Smiths fan. It's and it's like, yeah, the last time we had like cinematic Smiths fans was 500 days of summer. So like, <laughs> that's pretty funny. Um, I, did you guys see Saltburn yet? I have yeah. not. Oh, yeah, Jay, I did. Jay, Jay, you saw Saltburn? Oh my god! Oh yeah. man! So, uh, Saltburn. <laughs> oh man, Saltburn's the new movie from uh, Emerald uh, Fennell, who uh, did Promising Young Woman and uh, was also uh, on for Killing Eve, um, and uh, was Midge in uh, Barbie, uh, the pregnant Barbie. Uh, but Saltburn's about this. Uh, this uh the student at what is what was it oxford it's like, yeah, yeah yeah it's it and he he's played by barry keegan who is is really good and he, what he does is um he he doesn't have a place to go for like winter break or something so he summer, goes home yeah. yeah summer break so he goes home to, to his rich friend's house with him which is a, this big sprawling manor called saltburn yeah it's very, very British. And uh, it, it, this uh, his rich friend, Felix, who's played by Jacob uh, Alordi, who is from the Kissing Booth movies um, and Priscilla. He was always in Priscilla. Um, he uh, his family's that type of rich where they have a it's a castle. It's a fucking like manor castle. And they kind of take care of it. And they, the movie does a really good job of like getting into like that kind of rich world where it's like we own this giant house that has hundreds of years of history, but we only hang out in two rooms because we can't we can't like do stuff in the other one. And it's this really kind of it's it's a I, I got some like who's afraid of Virginia Wolf vibes where it's like, what is everyone's motive here? What's everyone? Everyone has an alternative ulterior thing going on here. And it's really good. Um it's definitely bringing, uh, you know, sex back to the cinema, which I really uh, enjoyed. Um, if you think, I wonder what inanimate object Barry Keoghan can make sexual. I was going to say it's sex is like not loosely saying sex with, you know, back to cinema. But do that. He, he'll fuck anything. Hey, dude, <laughs> it, it is. It is the horniest movie to not feature that much like actual like penetration and stuff and like but also like cringe and it 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 it, it feels like you're being manipulated as well as the characters are um and also uh Rosemond Pike is just top of her game man she is absolutely she plays the mother of felix the rich uh kid and she is just on another level uh in this movie but yeah i i really like saltburn uh i can see why some people might not have gelled with it but the character really impressed me i don't know 
um, I don't think she's been in anything else, but she plays the slutty sister, Venetia. Her name's Allison Oliver. I thought she was great. She has one scene in particular where she gives like this, you know, one of those heart wrenching monologues. It's basically an Oscar scene is what, you know, people joke around and say. But yeah, the acting is amazing all around. Oh, yeah. That 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 entire young cast was phenomenal. I mean, uh, Archie uh, uh, Medwicky, uh, Medwick, I'm butchering names this morning it's early um but he was in that tv show c that i really liked but he was the character i least liked but he's been killing it in features he was also in uh teen spirit midsommar and uh gran turismo you mean Um, uh, the guy who played farley yeah the cousin okay yeah yeah yeah. he was really good he was the one that was like straight off the bat was just like you don't belong here yeah uh, well he was also he was also kind of getting pushed out (laughs) by by oliver yeah yeah but like again it's this really great like cat and mouse everyone's manipulating everybody there's like some really weird shit going on and again it's it's so incredibly horny like just incredibly horny and i think i think the cinema needs more of that speaking (laughs) of uh i wanted to talk about how i saw yorgos lanthomos's poor things oh i was wondering i was like where are we going with weird horny what are we transitioning to of course yeah, it's yorgos. it can it can only be yorgos <laughs> lanthomos <laughs> i haven't seen it yet or as i like to call it yorgos lanthomos's frankenhooker I, I was gonna say it's it's like a frankenstein deal isn't it it, it is uh i don't want to say exactly how it is but basically it takes place in kind of an alternate universe kind of victorian era thing where Willem defoe plays this bad scientist who uh brings a woman back to life but she's uh basically because he brought her back to life her brain is uh, a complete blank slate. So she's learning to be human again. And she starts to, and uh, the the creature who's named uh, Bella Baxter is played by Emma Stone. Uh, and she, so she's basically regrowing and becoming a human being again. And she's figuring herself out. And uh, she becomes a very liberated woman. And also I look, uh, it, it's got a great cast because I also love Mark Ruffalo plays this uh, like playboy shyster lawyer. And um, and, and, and yeah, it kind of deals a lot with her, you know, kind of discovering the world and meeting all these different people and uh, wanting to travel and grow. And there is so much fucking. <laughs> That's <laughs> your <Yorgos Lanthimus. laughs> yeah. yeah. And, well, you know, it's it. It's about the human condition, so wouldn't be that without a whole lot of fucking. Yeah. Um, and, you yeah, know, I, I really loved it. Um, it was such an interesting take on the Frankenstein story, which itself uh, was an adaptation of uh, a, a book called Poor Things. Um, it, it, you know, just there's been so many different versions or inspirations from the story. It, I think this is such a unique take. And... Uh, made by Yorgos Lanthimos, it, it looked beautiful at uh, this, the set design and the world building was amazing. Yeah, no, it's, it was great. That's uh, one of the things I have to catch up on before we do our voting. Cause I missed the screening, but a funny story about the screening, one of the security guards, it, it's done by Fox searchlight, which is owned by Disney. And one of, one of the security guards that kind of keeps an eye on people, you know, they're they're looking for people bootlegging the movie basically um she had um she was ex- I, I i heard this story when we were at napoleon because i missed the poor thing screening and she had um she's like oh yeah it's a disney screening this is gonna be fun <laughs> oh, <laughs> and then she oh walked into poor things um oh. I've mainly, like I said, been catching up with award screener stuff. So I've caught up in a lot of stuff that you guys had already seen. So we've already talked about, but I just kind of, kind of want to rapid fire through some of them first. Um, and, you know, s- since we've already talked a little bit about Nazis, I saw Sisu finally. Yeah. Is that brilliant? A oh, brilliant. Oh, be. Brilliant. It was so much fun. It was oh, awesome. That's the that's the feel good. Oh, Dude, uh, Sisu's totally feel good. No, Sisu's the feel good family film of the of the holiday season. Of course. Um, also, I saw Dream Scenario, which nice, equally brilliant. I I loved a Dream Scenario. It was so it 
Oh, just so much fun. Um, the Iron Claw, I also saw, which I agree with everything Korea said about it. It is absolutely heart wrenching. I mean, it, it it's only horror when you stop to think that it's true. <laughs> yeah. But uh, uh, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles: Mutant Mayhem. Fuck yeah! Brilliant. Yeah, it was brilliant. A fun movie. It was it was awesome. And also the Super Mario Brothers movie. Awesome. <laughs> yeah. Oh, that reminds me. Uh, Jack Black's song is Bowser Peaches got nominated for a Globe, Golden Globe today. Oh, yeah. As it should. Mm-hmm. I mean, how hasn't Jack Blackie got it already? He should have. Like, Pick a Destiny should have gotten Best Picture. This one, actually, we haven't talked about yet. Trolls Band Together. Huh. <laughs> are you guys into the Trolls movies? No, uh, but I no, know you but are. I've heard I've heard good things. I love them all. They're so much fun. <laughs> the way they use music. This one, Trolls Band Together, they, we find out the branch, who's the Justin Timberlake troll, it was in a boy band when he was little. And um, basically, they have to go and save one of his boy band brothers. They, it's a brother's boy band. And uh, it, it, it's funny because his other boy bands, they're played by one of them is Eric Andre. Um and uh, Debbie Diggs is another one of them. It, it's it's really funny. So you were all about the brothers this week between Iron Claw and Trolls band together. <laughs> but Brotherly yeah, love. brothers banding together. Yep, all about. <laughs> you need to watch a Trolls movie after Iron Claw to just kind of like not be so weepy. Ugh. And and another movie, not really horror, but um, still a little disturbing. May December. You guys familiar with May December? Um, I haven't, I haven't seen, seen it, it, but I've heard yeah. about it. It's on Netflix. It it stars Natalie Portman as like a, like an actress who is playing Julianne Moore's character in an upcoming movie or TV show. So she goes and meets her to do research on the character, and it turns out it kind of slowly reveals why they're making a movie about Julianne Moore's character. And it's not really horror, but it's pretty disturbing. And it gets kind of, it gets kind of weird with um, how Natalie Portman's character is not really starts taking over her life, but you can see that, that as she's figuring out the character, she gets a little too involved kind of a thing. She's like Parker Posey in scream three. (laughs) <laughs> a, a, a little bit a little bit except not as comedic about it but yeah right uh, on a on a similar note have either of you guys seen eileen Mm-mm. no it's in my neon pack i need to see it yeah the new uh william oldroyd episode uh, uh, movie uh i i really dug it it's definitely a love it or hate it type of film but uh it's yeah it's this kind of uh pulp uh story about uh, this woman named uh, Eileen is played by Thomas McKenzie, who's uh, living in this small uh, town in 1960s Massachusetts. And she works at a, uh, you know, like a juvie detention for boys out out in the woods. And uh, her life is a mess. Like she has to li- like she's living with her alcoholic uh, ex cop dad, who's uh, completely falling apart, and she's lonely, and she's dealing with the isolation, and everybody dumps on her, and then Anne Hathaway, who plays this like highly lauded uh, New York psychologist, is uh, sent to start working at the uh, uh, juvie, and. Uh, it's hard to say what goes from there, but uh, it uh, like they start to become close and shit goes down. Yeah, no, that's definitely on my list to check out. I've heard some really good things about that. Yeah, I really dug it. Like, again, I feel like it's kind of a love it or hate it thing. But also between this and the holdover has been really on a roll with the uh, period Massachusetts uh, films. I still need to see the holdovers. Oh, man, that one is so good. Uh I have a rapid fire for some documentaries that I've been watching recently. Uh, first, uh, first off, have you guys seen? Is that black enough for you? No, uh, it's a documentary on Netflix. It's a it's a like a film essay about 1970s uh, black cinema. So it's all about you know what led up to black exploitation, the era of black exploitation, and its influence on uh, films. After they interview a lot of players in it and a lot of people who grew up and were influenced by it. Um, it's got one of the last and rare interviews with um, Harry Belafonte, 
which was just incredible to hear him talk and like be so candid about like his life and career. Uh, it's absolutely phenomenal. I highly recommend it. I It will ruin Saturday Night Fever and Rocky for you, though, because uh, it, it dives into like how uh, during an era where anti-heroes were the thing in Hollywood, Black Cinema was creating like actual heroes like Shaft and uh those type of characters. And then like Saturday Night Fever just completely ripped off those movies hard. And, but start John Travolta. Um, but yeah, is that black enough for you is on Netflix and it's phenomenal. Came out in uh, 2022. Um, another one is Cypher, um, which is a new documentary on Hulu that follows the rise of one of my favorite artists, um, Tierra Wack. Uh, she's a uh, rapper from uh, Philadelphia and it starts off as like a this is how she got her start and her coming up and all this stuff. And then it very quickly gets into uh, conspiracy theory, Illuminati shit like hard. It's really interesting. And um, if you're not familiar with her work, it's a it's a fun introduction to her and her style. Um, but also goes batshit bananas. <laughs> Um, and then, of course, Saw Renaissance, the new Beyonce movie. It's fucking incredible. Um, even if you're not a Beyonce fan, it's insane to see how they were able to pull off that level of like concert with all the moving parts. And uh, it's just so well made. And unlike the Taylor Swift movie, it's not just a, co- a concert playing out like they do a really good job of like mixing together the various shows throughout the tour. And uh yeah, it's really it's the the energy that comes off of that film is intoxicating. It's, uh, it's so good. Beyonce is such a great performer. Have Have you guys seen uh, Leave the World Behind on uh, Netflix? No. It's uh, Julia Roberts and Ethan Hawke. And how do you say his name? Mar- Marsal Ali. And it, Kevin Bacon is also in it. Um, it's it's basically it's an end of the world movie um it's this family uh julie roberts and ethan hawk's family they go they rent like an airbnb in the country they're from new york and while they're there something happens there's like a global blackout or not global national blackout and basically you know planes falling from the sky oil tankers running to ground all this shit and they are trying to figure out what's going on and it's basically a good thing that they're not in the city that they happen to be in the country. But, um, Marshala Ali, um, I think that's how you say his name. I don't know, but he, he plays a character who owns the house that they're renting and he shows up there because it's one of the safest places to be during this, during this crisis. And, um, and they don't really know what's going on because all the TV stations are showing, um, the, 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 emergency broadcast thing and none of their cell phones work, you know, so they don't really know what's happening, but yeah, it's a, there's a whole lot of distrust there. They're like, you know, cause they've only ever um, exchanged emails. Uh, they don't even recognize his voice. So they're like, Oh, is this guy really who he says he is, you know? And, and then they have to figure out what's going on. And it, I have to admit the ending is not entire. It's only satisfying for one character. And one character basically gets what they're after for the entire movie. (laughs) But the other ones, it leaves them hanging. You're like, okay, wait, this didn't really end, except I'm happy for this one character. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, I've heard really good things about it, and I'm very interested. Um, I I will say I'm already giving that movie huge props because uh, Letterboxd did their top four interviews, uh, and they interviewed the cast of the movie, and Julia Roberts said that – Milo and Otis was in her top four. So like shout out to Julia for spreading the <laughs> the book of Milo and Otis. <laughs> I take it. We've all seen Godzilla minus one. <laughs> yes. Yes. Best we film have of the year. Oh God my damn. gosh. It's, it's, it, it's amazing. It's is amazing. That, I loved it. Is that on the list for the critics groups, Jay, for uh, uh, n- no, we, um, a couple of, of my colleagues went out to the theater to see it and they started raving about it. So we, I had to kind of um, 
not really beg, but beg for <laughs> a screener. Um, and it was a really weird process I had to go through to get it because I try as, as the president of the SDFCS, I tried to request for everybody, but it was a process where you have to sign up for something and then they'll, they give you an account to this thing and then they load the movie in there. And I'm like, ah, everyone's got to do it themselves. They didn't just send it out. I had to ask for it, but, um, it's getting traction. People are people are loving it. Oh man, I'm I'm calling it best picture of the year. Godzilla minus one. I don't know about best picture. I mean, it's no cocaine bear, <laughs> um, but it is. Uh, that did come out this year. So far, it is my my favorite international picture of the year, which puts it above the zone of interest, which is uh, which. There's a, well, the zone of interest might be kind of partially an American movie, but it it's it's German. Um, but this is purely Japanese. This is a Toho Godzilla movie. <laughs> yeah. Oh, definitely. And I thought it was one of the more unique takes on Godzilla of the last couple decades, especially because it's uh, one of the few period Godzilla movies. Like, not a lot uh, have been said in the past. And it's kind of a prequel to Godzilla because uh, you get to see Godzilla before he becomes the Godzilla we know. Well, it's kind of a remake of the original Godzilla, kind of, because it's yeah. it's almost like not really an origin story, but but an origin story. I mean, it it it's like his first, you know, it, it's people's first experience with him. The reason it's called Minus One is because it's set at the end of World War Two and Japan. Japan is set at Japan zero They're You know, they're like they're rebuilding. So they're at zero. But then yeah. Godzilla comes around and sets them to less than zero. So it's. Yeah. Minus one. <laughs> yeah, I thought it was I, minus one because it was a prequel. Like it's before 1954. Yeah, that, that might have a little bit to do with it, but it it uh, I thought I always thought that it was because it was setting Japan back to minus zero or you know, like below zero. Yeah, there there was definitely a trailer that was like Japan at end of World War Two was set to zero because of they got the ever living shit bombed out of them and then godzilla shows up and then it's it's a minus one uh but also like yeah no i mean godzilla has had so many reboots has so many retellings of different eras it's surprising that they haven't gone back to world war ii because the original it, i personally I, I and i know a lot of people agree this is like the closest we've gotten to gojira of all the movies is going back to not only the time period but they you can tell the director a who was a huge Godzilla fan. I mean, he wrote, directed and did the VFX on this movie like a madman. And um, but it, it really takes a lot of the lessons from the original Gojira in not only the time period, but incorporating so much of Japanese culture. Um, a huge part of the movie is the transition from uh, from pre World War Two to post World War Two when it came to like the ideas of uh, soldiers' lives and kamikaze soldiers and like moving away from that mentality um, and what that means and it's and just also like because that one of the reasons why the original Gojira movie works is because there's a love story in the middle and during all of this that's very. Um, infused with what was going on with the culture at that time and marriages and what those roles meant and like breaking those bonds. And that's one of the reasons why I think the original Gojira is so good. Yes. Godzilla himself is awesome as shit, but like having that really good human element really works. And he is back to being a force of fucking destructive nature. I mean, when Godzilla first uses his atomic uh, breath in minus one, my eyes were wide as fuck and my jaw was on the floor for a solid five minutes the entire time. Like I was grip. I, Lindsay had a, I stopped hold. Lindsay pulled her hand out of mine. Cause I was just gripping it. Just like, oh, <laughs> so fucking good. I had to watch it. I got a screening link. So I had to watch it on my computer, which, you know, was not ideal. There was a screening last week of the color purple, mm. which is okay. I guess, um, and starting a half an hour after the screening of Color Purple was a 4DX screening of a Godzilla minus one. <laughs> Ooh. I almost went AWOL. I was like, that is so tempting right there. <laughs> you know, I, I, I had a beautiful kind of double night, double feature where I saw minus one 
uh, Thursday, I saw it at the fan event. And then the next night I saw Renaissance. So I'm surprised I can still hear because I saw <laughs> minus one in IMAX at the Chinese theater. And then Renaissance, they just had to crank the fuck up. So like going to see the king and then the queen was was really special. But minus one, man, like it's uh, it's so brutal. It's so good. And then you do get a chance to see because they have this like moment early on when the main character lands his kamikaze playing on a small island and there's like this little legend of like the locals call godzilla and he's more like small and dinosaur like but then they show like that the nuclear testing at in the bikini knolls like you know makes him bigger but like pre-godzilla like smaller godzilla is was uh, his introduction was fucking terrifying i nearly pissed myself like just coming out of the darkness like that oh yeah it was like the T-Rex appearing in Jurassic Park. That's totally what it was. And the thing is, and I don't know if he actually eats people, but he's picking people up and throwing them around with his mouth. I mean, it 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 is like a T-Rex attack. It's not a typical Godzilla where he's just smashing things. This Godzilla loves throwing shit, and I love <laughs> it so much. There's so many scenes where you just see like a train or a boat go flying through the fucking air. What is it? Oh man. When they, when they come up with their big plan to take down big G and they're like, all right, we have our first, like we have our first ship out there to give us a warning and that are like the first parameter or something. And then you just see this giant boat go flying through the air and smash into the port. And then you hear the announcement, the first barrier has been broken. It's like, yeah, no shit. <laughs> no, it's like well, they have a ship that's luring him in, yeah. and it's and and it says something like, "The lure ship has been destroyed" or something like that. <laughs> but it's like a solid thirty seconds after it's gone over everyone's head and smashed into the ground and exploded. Yeah, no, I mean, there's some good bits in the in this movie. There's some levity. It's um, it's more than I mean, Godzilla is only in like four scenes. It's more. It, it's actually a movie. It's a good movie that happens to have godzilla in it i mean they're pretty much like, like you were you were talking about the um you were talking about the kamikaze pie who lands in the island the, the main character is basically a disgraced kamikaze pilot it's a kamikaze pilot who chickened out and he didn't want to do to kamikaze so well it's kind that's of, a bunch of chickened out it's said you know the war was pretty much over and he didn't want to die for nothing yeah yeah which that factors into his redemption arc kind of i guess you know if you want to call it that you know <laughs> well but and, and that's the whole thing is because a lot of people viewed him as checking out like he, there's a and it shows him going back home and all the houses are like completely leveled and he runs into a neighbor and she's like wait you were a kamikaze you weren't supposed to come back and like He's kind of ostracized by a lot of people in society. And then you see okay. even when he first lands his plane, the, the on that island, he you know, the mechanic is like, you know, we took a look at your plane. There's nothing wrong with it. Yeah. You know, because because that's why he came back. He he's he was like, oh, there's a mechanical failure in the plane. I couldn't complete the mission. And they're like, oh, there's nothing wrong with your plane, dude. <laughs> why are you here? <laughs> but it's really cool because they like very organically show like how that like that. The, that mentality of like going down of of doing like the you're not coming back on how that has a toll on someone because he goes through a lot of PTSD over that and that decision and that guilt of not completing completing air quotes completing the mission and then like the mentality change amongst characters of like yeah no you know what that is kind of fucked up that we do just throw lives away essentially and leads to a very beautiful like redemption and complete culture change by the end of the movie which is just so well done and then seeing godzilla eat and kill the rest of the mechanic crew gives him double ptsd <laughs> well, yes <laughs> especially because at one point um he has godzilla in the sights of his 20 millimeter gun on the plane and he doesn't pull the trigger so he's got more not only survivor's guilt he's got could i have stopped this guilt yeah no well we know as the audience that that wouldn't have done no shit. yeah yeah, but he does. But, but also, yeah. and, and I know, and I know that Jacob could appreciate this. Um, a lot. There's a lot of Jaws influence. In oh yes, Godzilla might as well. Like a lot of Jaws influence. <laughs> when he's when 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 Thick Boy is swimming after them, that was just like <laughs> I. Uh, there's so many butt clenching moments in that movie. Yeah. Like, and that needs to be a, a, a applauded. The tension in these scenes, because sometimes when you get these big moving cgi bits the the gravity of the situation is lost because there, it doesn't feel like there's weight to it 
and they did a really phenomenal job with this. And it's 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 they shot this thing for fifteen million dollars. That's how much this was made. Wow. Like, and the amount of like tension and just masterful, like ah, it's it's insane. The plan they come up with to stop him is I don't want to spoil anything, but they're like in this big room full of all of the the citizens and they're, you know, everyone's coming up with their part. And the scientist who comes up with the plan, the plan is so hokey. It is totally hokey. And everybody it, it the audience is thinking it and everybody in this room is thinking it. They're like, well, that's not going to work. That's going to work. And the, the doc goes. If anyone has a better idea, I'll listen to it. <laughs> but this is what we have. <laughs> it's one of those things because, you know, it's it's so it's so funny because like sometimes in order to stop something like a Godzilla, you have to invent something like the oxygen bomb, right? Because that was the other thing with the original uh, Gojira. Oxygen destroyer. Oxygen destroyer, where you kind of have to create this kind of almost MacGuffin thing that's like impossible to make. Gojira did a really good job of being like, all right, we're going to create this ultimate weapon but like i need to die after because this can't be used ever again you know that was one of the uh amazing things of the original this one yes it sounds hokey as shit but it it, it makes sense it's that it, it's done so well where it's like yeah this sounds ridiculous as fuck but like the 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 science is there or at least the theory is <laughs> yeah the the docs he sold it when he was telling them about it he's all this is how this is gonna work yeah <laughs> and then and then immediately after they're like do you really think it's gonna work it's I, <laughs> no one has a better idea yeah or it's like they ask him they're like oh can you guarantee this to work he's all no i can't guarantee this is gonna work but it's never what else we before. got <laughs> <laughs> yeah it's phenomenal um I know we're praising the shit out of minus one, and uh, this is going to kind of lead into our main topic uh, a bit more because our main topic is, of course, Godzilla, right? Um, Got to be Godzilla. Um, but everyone's been loving minus one, and I've, as a Star Trek fan, I've been seeing this mentality coming up a lot as well, where something is done really well, something is done really well in the uh, spirit of like the original or in the series or bringing it back. And then the fandom does these backhanded compliments, right? Where they're like, oh, yes, finally, we have something good in this franchise. And it's and it feels like they're invalidating what has come before. So like with Star Trek, a lot of people are saying Strange New Worlds. Finally, this is the Star Trek series we've been waiting for. And it's like, but we have like five other Star Trek shows going on right now. Why are you invalidating that? And like a lot of people are saying that to Jonathan Frakes, who's like involved in all of Star Trek. And he's like, dude, why are you like shitting on my other work, man? Um, and that's happening a lot with with uh, Godzilla minus one, because first of all, we live in, in, a, in a great era of Godzilla, because not only do we have amazing films coming out of Japan, there are these very beautiful original uh, it takes on on our thick boy but we also have legendary uh putting out some of the best hokiness i mean what do you guys think like i mean between like you know um kong or godzilla versus kong and like the new uh monarch legacy of monsters like we're really getting into yeah that. um well i tell you this much uh when i was a kid i was a godzilla fanatic i mean i still am but i rented every godzilla vhs tape i possibly could for my local video store and it's all over the place the whole franchise the whole series like i never knew what i was going to get from the godzilla movies i was renting you know because it was before letterbox and all that like i i just had a vhs box to to you know tell me and usually just because it had a cool cover so you get all kinds of stuff you know like uh godzilla versus adora where it's godzilla versus pollution uh then you got uh destroy all monsters which is like uh, Godzilla Throwdown, the original, which is, you know, stark drama about the horrors of nuclear war. And uh, then you got Godzilla 1984, where Godzilla comes back uh, at the height of the Cold War as a nuclear menace. So, you know, that's the thing. Godzilla can be so many different things across so many different movies. It's uh, so it, it's all interpretive. I've been shouting it that all Godzillas are valid. Right. You they know, truly are. Everything from and it can be a hokey monster showdown. It can be a he uh, a hefty, you know, uh, socio or uh, socio, you know, uh, message uh, within it. I mean, uh, Biolante, 
is one of the best Godzilla movies out there. And it's all about it's going back to Hedorah with versus pollution and nature fighting back against it and, and things of that nature. I mean, it's great. I would even say the American Zilla in its own way is valid in showing like how not to do it. Uh, <laughs> the, but the animated series to the Zilla is really dope. Um, and not only that, but Toho themselves have an awesome Godzilla YouTube page where they have Godzilla puppets doing like a hokey Monster Island thing. Oh, yeah, yeah. It's like Monster Island as a sitcom. <laughs> it's so much fun. I mean, yeah, it's 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 so strange to hear these complaints coming out, especially when it's like this. This franchise is like 60 years old, right? I mean, you got to have different interpretations. Not every... If you, if your character isn't at least being thrown into different things, why not? James Bond, I think, is the closest thing that um, we have to a character that has gone through so many eras and so many different interpretations. And if we were still making movies exactly like Dr. No and not letting Bond evolve into different eras like his Star Wars era with Moonraker to yeah. his Dark Knight era with the Daniel Craig. Even the Daniel Craig movies changed dramatically from like, born ripoffs to dark night ripoffs to finally something of its own you know um it's yeah it's just again toxic fandom why why is it every time i propose like a topic it's always bitching about the fandoms because it bugs you <laughs> yeah you guys give me a lot to bitch about thanks for but, good conversation yeah and you know what i'm so pumped for uh godzilla x con the new empire uh, that trailer that dropped this week yeah was so fun and if even if it's dumb as fuck i mean come on the last movie introduced hollow earth okay like we're <laughs> legendary is in it's silly godzilla it's end of show a silly godzilla phase and i'm loving it i mean god's uh gvk was so much fun um it was silly it was great it had awesome action and i can't wait to see um Thick Boy and Ape Man just go fucking <laughs> team up. And do you think that possibly um, Godzilla quote fans? And I use the quotes because you know how I always say that a lot of horror fans don't really like horror because <laughs> they just like to complain about it. I think the same might be true of a lot of Godzilla fans. Do you think that they take it too seriously, and that's why they can't have fun with movies like? Godzilla versus Kong or King of the Monsters, you know, they, they like they, they can't they can't just have fun with a Godzilla movie. Yeah, I think it's just a lot of the times in particular fandoms, people interpret a, uh, you know, like a movie or character or something specifically a certain way, usually like the version that they grew up on or they knew when they were younger and uh, they're just not open to change. Like if uh, there's variant on a uh, character or story then yeah it pisses people off i i would say that the godzilla fandom is far more accepting of change you know i know i know where the main topic is bitching about those people that were like invalidating other godzillas um but i think it's a very it's it's a very loud crowd but i think it's a very small group i feel like the godzilla crowd are very into the idea of him being what he needs to be for the film right um and are much more adaptable than say horror bros right you know uh because it's it's the same with star wars fans you know i think uh freddie prince jr surprisingly you wouldn't think it, he would be the one to put it so eloquently but he said i said uh you know there's he knows the reason why everything is. It's all about balance and all this stuff. And people are just pissed that it's not the same thing that it was for them. But that's because these movies aren't always going to be made for your audience all the time. You know, Star Wars especially is always being made for the younger generation of the time. And if you're not a part of that, it probably won't be made for you, you know, and that's fine. That's OK. Like not I mean, to, I love Godzilla. It's it's one of my favorite film franchises of all time. Not every Godzilla movie is for me. And I, I don't like every Godzilla movie I've seen, and that's okay. You know, uh, I still love it. I still love every interpretation because they're all valid. Like, I shit, I even come on. How many times have I given ninety eight its props this episode alone? <laughs> you know, like, uh, it, you you gotta have fun. I mean, Final Wars, where it's literally yeah. just like we're gonna create the most 
simple plot to have Godzilla fight everybody and they drop him into various they literally just like pick him up in a ship and drop him like all right now you're gonna fight this guy all right you're done with that one it's it's like watching a video game it has great lines like the alien calling Godzilla uh fish breath ah how yeah. dare you fish breath like come on <laughs> so love the thick boy love let him be what he needs to be to facilitate the story and yes minus one is an amazing film especially a godzilla film it's incredible uh but that doesn't invalidate what else is going on and uh i'm always going to butcher the title of godzilla kong new empire because it's not versus it's x um yeah but i'm so excited i love that somebody did a uh recut of the trailer setting it to the boys are back in town yes which, by the way, uh, are we starting our Boys Are Back in Town band? Because I feel like there needs to be Boys Are Back in Town songs. Um, but yeah. Oh, and then and then people are like complaining about uh, Godzilla's new colors for New Empire. Uh, like one half is like, yes, Godzilla has purple uh, uh, atomic breath or so now. So he's, so he's uh, you know, now a bi icon and other people are like, I don't like that color. It's like, it's fun colors. Like, come on, guys. It's Godzilla went Super Saiyan. Yeah, I love him, dude. He's a bi icon. <laughs> yeah, dude, calling it. Like, Godzilla you know, goes woke. I love it. I can't wait to see <laughs> Godzilla march the next Pride Parade next to Baba Duke. It's great. <laughs> yeah, put him on the Pride Parade. Yes. <laughs> Con. <laughs> Godzilla is kind of the ultimate androgynous because it, we we've been saying he, but isn't it a she? Depends on the interpretation, too, because, yeah. I mean, yeah. 98 Zilla was a she, you know, yeah. um, we don't or know. It's like how. Jurassic Park where they uh, were able to uh, they were hermaphroditic. They were able, able to, to have switch. Their own shit, baby, eggs. Yeah, life finds a way. I don't know. Minya uh, Godzilla Jr. or even I mean, even the show era. I mean, the original Godzilla died at the end of Gojira. And then we had uh, from Godzilla raids again. It was basically a second Godzilla, like a Godzilla Jr. took over. So I mean, like. <laughs> You know what I mean? Like, I don't know how these things come about, but like, you know, fuck it. It's great. That, also, that was the big the big twist in Rodan was that there were two of them. Yeah. I mean, uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, God, I love Rodan. I do, uh, too. My favorite. You guys know that. I think Rodan needs a better agent after how lame was treated in King of the Monsters. <laughs> uh, hey, you know what? King of the Monsters is also valid. Yes, don't get me wrong. The whole Kyle Chandler's character somehow being at the center of everything always was a bit frustrating. But you know what? We got some really great kaiju scenes and some really beautiful like shots of, of them going ham. Hey, so I still love it. Plus, I mean, I can't be mad at a Mothra movie. I really can't. Mothra, that's my girl. You know, one, one of my die. favorite moments um, in the MonsterVerse was... Um, in the, the 2014 Godzilla, the, you're you're in a theater. You have to see it in a theater. And um, he's the, the Mutos are over, and the Mutos go, and you think it's like all loud, and then Godzilla goes, and and it's just it, it's part in your hair, you know, in the theater, you know, and because you, you think that the Mutos are all fierce, and Godzilla's like, really, little boy check this out <laughs> man i love your godzilla impression that's beautiful <laughs> yeah, you're getting good at that Screehawk. Screehawk. but hey, um, you, you add a little bit of echo to that <laughs> <laughs> uh i also want to give a shout out to uh skull island the animated series that takes place in the legendary monster verse uh that's oh, on yeah. netflix it was written by Brian Duffield, and it's a lot of fun. Um, friend of the podcast, Brian Duffield. <laughs> friend of the podcast, Brian Duffield. Um, it, and and I think that's another thing that encapsulates it, because to to also say that like the legendary movies aren't valid, like Skull Island. Honestly, when when I was watching it, I was kind of expecting like a Godzilla type kaiju show, but that that show actually captured the spirit of king kong more than anything like when they're on skull island because it doesn't feature kaiju kaijus it features giant prehistoric things so like there's a giant prehistoric dog that one of the characters is best friends with and rides and stuff and there's, there's giant... a giant kraken octopus oh my squid. god the the kraken was was like i was sitting there i was like i normally don't get like 
you know tensed up over like animated stuff but like I, they they did a really good job of making that thing like kind of scary and when he finally fights kong uh, towards the end of the series it's brutal um, well, that's kind of what kong was um kong w- was less kaiju and more like dinosaurs yeah you know? true like, so i mean that kind of just tracks with with kong in general yeah and that's what i dug about because i know uh brian was tweeting about it quite a bit when it came out and he even said that like they wouldn't let him do any known kaiju. They had to kind of create their own, but like stick, stay within this like mode. And I thought they did a really good job of that. And it just made me really want to revisit like all the classic Kong movies and, you know, sit down for four hours to watch Peter Jackson's. (laughs) (laughs) Oh yeah. I got to rewatch that one. So like most Peter Jackson movies, I think it's best to treat them as like a mini series and do them in little 30 minute chunks. (laughs) <laughs> i mean i know There's but an idea. it's also one of those things like peter jackson's king kong like i it's like a half hour has to be trimmed by this but i don't know what half hour to trim because it's yeah. all so good you know it's yeah. like it's like you you did everything you did extended versions of it and i love it all i'm just very tired there's so <laughs> but it, it, it's all dope like oh, especially that the central park scene where it's kong and uh Naomi Watts uh, on the ice. Oh, such a great scene. That's when you uh, you do a part. I, I guess maybe Peter Jackson learned from that because he split up Lord of the Rings and uh, The Hobbit into three parts. That's when you. <laughs> but even those are three hour movies. So you got this nine hour epic. <laughs> Hobbit Jeez. didn't need to be three movies. Hobbit no, needed. No, to no, 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 no. It did not. It did not. Lord of the Rings kind of did. But. You know, it just the movie would have gone a lot faster if Frodo had ridden on King Kong's back or something. <laughs> like, imagine him riding a motor on King Kong. For a moment, I thought you were going to bring up the Eagles, and I was about to get so pissed off. No, I was no, like, that's... we are not having this argument on this podcast. I will fight yeah, you. <laughs> forget the Eagles. I want to see Frodo team up with King Kong. The ah. Jackson verse. Yes. Oh man, <laughs> King Kong of Middle Earth. Make it happen. That's what Space Jam 2 should have been. It's just like them riding through the Peter Jackson verse and like, yeah, Frodo riding King Kong while while the Feebles are just like getting fucked up and dealing with PTSD in the corner, you know? <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, let's uh, let's call this one an episode. Um, what do you think of Godzilla Minus One? Uh, we know you loved it because if you're listening to this podcast, you there's no way you could not have loved Godzilla Minus One. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, and and what do you think of the other Godzilla movies? Don't 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 tell us that you're one of these Godzilla fans who's not really a fan because that'll make us sad. Yeah. So what's your favorite interpretation of Godzilla? What's your favorite Godzilla movie? Are you watching Legacy of Monsters? Because I'm having a lot of fun with it. Yeah, uh, I dig it. Somewhere out there, there's somebody whose favorite interpretation of Godzilla is the Matthew Broderick '98 Godzilla, the the aliens clone. And and if it is, hit me up because I need I need yeah, I need reason. I want to revisit it, but I need more motivation. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Um, all right. Our uh, theme song is by Restless Spirit. So go check them out. And our artwork is by Chris Fisher. So go check him out. Uh, you can find us on any of the socials as under Eye on Horror or at iHorror.com, which is the site we all call home. And uh yeah, we'll see you in a couple weeks. I think our next episode is going to be our top tens for the year. Mm. So you'll probably be hearing more about Godzilla minus one. <laughs> I'm Most likely, it's pretty, yes. It's pretty safe to say it's probably going to make, uh, especially because it's also so fresh and we're so pumped on it. It's probably yeah. going to make a few of our lists, a few yeah. of our lists. There's only a few of us. <laughs> <laughs> that is, and, and it, it is going to be the best kaiju film until Troll 2 comes out. <laughs> The sequel to the Troll Kaiju movie, not Troll 2 from the 90s. Although that is great. <laughs> not Troll 2, the best movie ever made. I mean, <laughs> what? The best worst movie. Uh, <laughs> all right, cool. So uh, we will see you in a couple weeks. Uh, and you can yell at us about our top 10 lists for the year. So until then, uh, I'm James J. Edwards. I'm Jacob Davison. I'm Jonathan Korea. Keep your eye on horror. <laughs>